the reference for the question is coming from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12, verse 5, and the online lecture discussion. The question reads, it is indicated that embodied persons find it difficult to remain in a place or remain by themselves, even for those on the spiritual path. Why is this the case and what can we do to fix this? So let's have a look at the verse first of all. The verse reads, Greater is their difficulty whose minds are set on the unmanifest. For the goal, the unmanifest, is hard for the embodied to reach. So in the context, what this verse is talking about is different types of spiritual practice. The essence of spiritual practice is, as you think, so you become. We maintain our attention on the spiritual goal. Now this verse here is talking about those who have chosen as their spiritual goal the underlying reality that gives rise to perceptions, emotions and thoughts. The self or the identity that is not defined by any of your physical, emotional or intellectual qualities or properties. The pure I am. So maintaining an awareness of that is very difficult for the embodied. Now this is the key of the question. What does he mean by the embodied? He means those that are fully identified with the body. It means the individual who believes that I am a body, rather than I have a body. They're very different statements, very different platforms of knowledge. In fact, the phrase I am a body is not something that a person would say because they are so identified as a body that they don't have the level of objectivity to make that claim. What's a simple example? When a person is incredibly angry, they're so embedded and caught up in their anger that they don't really even have the objectivity to say, I'm angry. They are anger. Because when you say, I'm angry, that's another way really of saying, I have anger. I have anger in my mind. That's not the language that we use, but that's in a sense what we're saying. Other languages do use that kind of phrasing. In French, for example, the translation of I am hungry is I have hunger. So in a similar way, when a person says, I am angry, they're saying, I have anger. But when you're really angry, when you're totally caught up in your anger, you don't even say, I have anger. Your experience is that you have become anger. So take that idea. Now, this is what we're talking about with regards to being the embodied. I am a body versus I have a body. The moment you say, I have a body, then you've made a distinction. There's me and the body. So the embodied is the one who looks through their body rather than looking at it. And you don't recognize that you're looking through it. Our experience of ourself is that I am a body, but I'm so embedded in it that I'm not aware. So this is a lack of objectivity. So let's go back to the question. It's indicated that embodied persons find it difficult to remain in a place or remain by themselves. Why is this the case? So the phenomenon that he's describing here is the difficulty that we have in being alone. So, simple question. Why do we find it difficult to be alone? We come home from work or school or wherever we've been and the house is empty. And the first thing we do is turn on the radio, turn on the television listen to a podcast, for company. The question is why? What happens if we are alone? Well, of course, we feel lonely. We are attached to a whole host of things in the world. Those attachments give us a sense of stability. Think of a tree, a young tree that has just been replanted in your garden. What do you do? You put some stakes either side of that tree and you bind it with some rope to keep it stable. Those attachments, those ropes, keep the tree stable 
until its roots strike into the soil, grip, and now it's strong enough to stand on its own. Our attachments to people and things and groups and environments act in the same way. They give us a sense of stability. The attachments that we have are threatened. Or, perhaps to put it another way, they're not being fed. And so that sense of being alone comes in. Because I'm attached to having friends around me, having family around me, just being around people. So one of the ways that we interpret this is a threat to our safety. And if you take, for example, an evolutionary perspective, that makes sense. The lone human was at risk. We are much safer, much more able to survive if we are in a group. So in a sense, there's an evolutionary logic to the idea that the lone human being is more at risk. But it's not fundamentally true. We're not actually at any kind of risk. But the way that we interpret that sense of being alone is my attachments are not being fed and there's an anxiety. And so to get rid of that anxiety, we go back into company, whether it's a radio or a podcast or whether it's actual people or your pets. So fundamentally, the problem is the thoughts that arise. When we are avoiding being alone, what we're avoiding are the thoughts arising in the mind. We can't stay in the present. We have concerns. We have unfulfilled desires. We have unmet attachments. All of these now become available to us for our awareness. It could be that these are sort of bubbling and frothing underneath the surface a lot. But when we are with company, we are distracted. And so we're not aware of those. And those distractions help to keep us feeling calm. But when we are alone and these thoughts all come up into our awareness, that bubbling of thoughts, those ripples across the mind, we experience as anxiety. And that's why we distract ourselves with company. So there's a lack of self-sufficiency, a lack of an ability to stay in the present. So it's important to understand that solitude and company are both necessary for our growth and well-being. So we're talking about the lack of self-sufficiency as the inability to be alone. We should not take this idea too far and say, well, I should strive to be more and more and more alone. Having connection, having relatedness is as much a genuine human need as those times of solitude. So what we need to first of all do as we're starting to explore this idea of solitude versus company is recognize our needs versus our wants. Your body has certain needs in order for you to grow, flourish, and be a good, healthy human being. Food, sleep, water, exercise, etc. So too does your mind. There is a need for connection. So that's why it's important to understand this. If we misread or misinterpret this idea that self-sufficiency means the capacity to be alone, then we only strive for solitude and we get entirely out of balance. So recognize my inner personality needs company. It also needs solitude. The problem with getting out of balance is of course that we become dependent on company. We can never be alone. We can never have solitude, even for a moment. Being alone with my thoughts is too much. We can also get out of balance in the other way. We can become attached to solitude. And we read these texts and we say, ah, oh, maybe I'm a little more evolved than others because I live alone and I don't find that I need to be around people and I'm happy to be on my own. It could be that I find it difficult to be with others. I don't feel comfortable around other people. I don't know how to relate to them. 
So the inability for us to be with others is as much a limitation as our inability to be alone. So that's why it's important to have a balanced view. Otherwise we misread some of these ideas and go too far in the other direction. So this is the first part of understanding what we can do about it. Recognizing that we actually do have a need for connection. So ensuring that that's taken care of. So what else can we do about it? The joy that comes with solitude and the benefit that comes with solitude grows with spiritual practice. So I've gone into the three spiritual disciplines elsewhere, so I won't go into them here. Very briefly, we have gratitude and devotion for the mind. We have reflection and contemplation for the intellect. And we have unselfish action for the body. What's happening as we practice these is that those egoistic attachments are beginning to diminish. And so as those attachments diminish, the exaggerated demand for solitude or the exaggerated demand for company also begins to diminish. Go back to the analogy of the tree with the roots. As we practice spirituality, the roots are striking deep. Our identity is striking deep into our personality. And when the tree has matured enough, you can take away those stakes in a similar way as we come to know who and what we are, as you start to understand your true identity, the attachments you don't need, then you can enjoy being alone because you don't have the attachments and the demands for company. You can enjoy being in company because you don't have that unhealthy demand for being alone. Another one of the key aspects is following your conscience and conviction in all that you do. Any time we do anything that violates our conscience, which is that inner voice, that inner feeling, deeper than just surface emotion or moods, that tells us what is right. Any time we violate our conviction, which is our intellect's thinking about what the right thing to do is, then that will result in mental agitation and anxiety. And we've all experienced this. We do something that we ought not to have done, and then later on, we feel a sense of regret. There's that anxiety. It's coming not from the action, but because of the violation of the conscience and the conviction. So being alone often exposes this anxiety to us. Thoughts bubble up. So when we violate our conscience, there is going to be a reaction. You put vinegar and baking soda together, you get a bubbling up, a reaction. There's nothing you can do about it. Similarly, when you put into your personality choices that violate the conscience, there'll be a bubbling up of thoughts. Being alone means that we are much more aware of our own thoughts now. And these thoughts disturb us. So what do we do? We distract ourselves. So this is one of the key things that we can do. Follow your conscience and conviction. Another thing you can do is to start analyzing your reaction to being alone. So put yourself in that position of being alone, truly alone. What am I feeling once I start to put myself into being alone? Is it fear or anxiety? Melancholy? Is it depression? What, what's the feeling I get by making myself alone? Then what are the messages that I'm being told? So we touched on earlier the idea of a threat to our safety. What are you afraid of? What are you anxious about? So this is what we're doing is analyzing the feeling aspect, the feeling part, and the meaning aspect. And what do I do to distract myself? Where do I go? Do I go to political podcasts? Do I go to cat videos? Do I go to something else? What's my go-to? So you're starting to learn about your own mind's reaction. The more you can get a picture of your own personality, 
then the more you're going to be able to manage this goal that you have of being more comfortable being alone. Which brings me to the next aspect, which is make a plan for being alone. There's a quote that I've seen attributed to Conor McGregor, a UFC fighter. The more you seek the uncomfortable, the more you become comfortable there. If you actively seek to put yourself in the uncomfortable situations, you become more comfortable there. So make a training plan, if you like, for being alone. In the same way that you schedule in exercise. There are things that you schedule in. You can schedule in alone time. And that's different from scheduling in me time. Okay, you might have heard this phrase, I'm scheduling in me time. That often means doing things that you like. Now I just want some time to be alone. I'm going to listen to some music and listen to that podcast and just relax in the bath. Nothing wrong with that. That's also necessary. But what we're talking about here is making a plan for actually being alone, away from those things also. So you're minimizing the stimuli that you bring in to keep you company. It is indicated that embodied persons find it difficult to remain in a place or remain by themselves, even for those on the spiritual path. Why is this the case and what can we do to fix this? We are dependent on distractions and dependent upon company to stop ourselves from being alone with our thoughts. What can we do to fix this? Become comfortable being alone with your thoughts. And secondly, improve the quality of those thoughts so that they don't disturb you. Improve the quality of your thoughts by improving the quality of your choices. Follow your conscience and conviction. The thoughts are less disturbing. And even when they are disturbing, if you're practiced being alone, you can watch them come, observe them, and watch them go. You look at your thoughts rather than looking through them.